that very seldom do we talk about that there is no one Christian movement. Uh, there are uh, Christian movements that have been filled with hatred and the justification of enslavement, the justification of settler colonialism, the justification of the extermination of native people on this soil and in South America and all over the Caribbean, uh, the depopulation of Africa sanctioned by a certain kind of Christianity that is really empire Christianity. It does nothing but love power. It, uh, it is very uh, uh, macho and very masculine in its nature and it is very fundamentalist and, and it, it enforces a status quo kind of value system. On the other hand, there's a faith movement that has always been a resistance to the status quo. It's already always been a faithful resistance to empire religion. Uh, and so when he walked out there and held up his Bible in front of the church, it was a statement to that empire religion, uh, to, uh, to uh, that we're still together, uh, we, we, we're going to fight to hold on to this thing. We're going to fight uh, to return me to office because we know that's what he's talking about. Uh, but he held up that Bible in which to solidify that very racist base, that clan or originating base. Somebody might get upset with that, but that's, the, that's really the nature of, uh, of religion. We've always had a religion that preached, slaves be obedient to your masters. We always had a religion that preached uh, that secular authority has been appointed by God. And I hear people all the time, particularly that Mr. Pillow guy, uh, saying that this man in the White House has been elected and ordained by God. And, I, and I'm putting that out there because you got one of them pillars, burn it. You got one of those pillars, throw them out of your house, right? Don't buy one. Uh, and, 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 and that's a part of the sort of the struggle that we're engaged in when they talk about cultural wars. It's not culture, it's ideology. It's an ideological war. It's a war of theology. It's a war uh, in order for those of us who believe in inclusion and those of us who believe in, in hearing one another and respecting one another versus those who want to control the world and bend the world towards their own ideology and their own understanding and their own greed because it's not just bending it to their ideology. It's, it's, it's also bending the world into a kind of paradigm where they can steal everything they want, including lands and culture and resources. So that's the battle. So he stood up there and, and basically tapped into his ideological base, uh, which uh, we have to struggle against and, 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 and deal with. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana voice for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. For over five decades, Graylin Hagler has been on the front lines in Chicago, Boston, and Washington, DC, and continues his advocacy for political, economic, and racial justice. He has protested injustices against Blacks and Latinos confronted corporations on hiring practices and challenged local governments, system, systemic injustices, including as an outspoken critic of military tactics used by police. He has marched, organized coalitions, been arrested, all the while continuing as a voice of nonviolent resistance. He's been a tireless partner in the struggle, struggle for full Palestinian political and human rights too. Graylin is senior pastor at Plymouth Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Washington, DC and Washington, DC co-leader of the Poor People's Campaign. So it's timely and important that we speak today with our friend, Pastor Graylin Hagler. Hagler, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Let's get right to it, Graylin. Uh, for those of us around the country, while we remain drawn to Minneapolis and all that's happening there, in fact, uh, the memorial service for George Floyd is happening as we speak, but we've also been following what's been happening in our nation's capital. So why don't you update us about what's been about the latest in uh, Washington, D.C.? Well, there's been actions 
uh, pretty much every day. We were under 11 p.m. curfew last night, but the previous two nights we were on a 7 p.m. curfew uh, as they tried to quote unquote clamp down on the protesters and the demonstration. Uh, and uh, you know, one of the one of the important things is that uh, on as you know, because everybody saw it on Monday, uh, uh, basically uh, protesters were attacked. Uh, by military, by military police, uh, by police, uh, and they were pepper bombed and rubber bullets and pushed out of the way with shields so that uh, uh, the, the guy in the White House could walk across Lafayette Park and uh, stand in front of uh, the Episcopal Church there on the corner across from the park and hold up his Bible uh, and uh, had nothing to say but held up his Bible as a symbolic tactic to continue to try to fan the flames of his base. Uh, and so there's been uh, demonstrations. And one thing that was uh, I thought was great uh, the next day, which would have been Tuesday, uh, the, the crowd really quadrupled outside of Lafayette Park uh, in response to uh, the tactic that happened the previous day. And so they were stretched all the way back uh, down uh, 16th Street and all around. And one of the things that um, the uh, Admit the president has been engaged in is trying to enlarge the perimeter of protection, uh, which only demonstrates that uh, that they're really afraid of the public, really afraid of these voices. Um, I don't know if they expected uh, for the reaction to be as strong as it has been, uh, but uh, but one of the things that is clear is that uh, they cannot put this genie back in the bottle uh, because people are really sick and tired, and and also I think the thing that really got to folks was to be able to graphically look at video as somebody dies in front of your eyes uh, all over the country and all over the world. Because I've received notices that people have been marching in Amsterdam, and people have been marching in the UK, and people have been marching all over. Palestinians have stood up in solidarity with what was going, what is going on in this country. Um, because people recognize uh, what it looks like um, when folks uh, attempt to oppress, when folks do oppress, um, the, kind, the kind of characteristics that they carry on, it's a fascism. And I think clearly in the United States, we can realize just how fragile this thing we have called a democracy is. Um, yeah, I, I've also seen the picture and, and it's still continuing, I believe. Uh, and think of the symbol of this, uh, uh, troops lining the steps of the Lincoln Memorial as they overlook protesters in D.C. I mean, I, I'm not ignorant of uh, Lincoln's mixed legacy, you know, uh, uh, during the Civil War. But isn't it mind boggling to find troops guarding the Lincoln Memorial from people participating in nonviolent demonstrations, protesting, oh, protesting the killing of an unarmed black man? I mean, it's, it's mind boggling, really. Well, they, they understand that that symbolically, that's where the 1963 march took place, uh, <clears throat> uh, where King spoke. So they understand the symbolism of that, understand the symbolism of what it means if everyday people take over that monument uh, and is able to organize and speak from that monument. So they're closing down, trying to close down all those symbols from the people. You're, uh, um, you've been involved uh, um, in, in protests and demonstrations your entire adult life. Um, and you, you, you build broad coalitions between people of different faiths and also just people of goodwill of no particular religious faith. And yet you uh, are a Christian pastor. Uh, I want you to say a word about the optics uh, and, and just the use and abuse of the president's use of the Bible as a prop in the church, St. John's Church uh, as, as a prop on Monday night. You referred to it, but say a little bit more about that. Well, it's, I'm going to come at it this way. That very seldom do we talk about that there is no one Christian movement. Uh, there are uh, Christian movements that have been filled with hatred and the justification of enslavement, the justification of settler colonialism, the justification of the extermination of native people on this soil and in South America and all over the Caribbean, uh, the depopulation of Africa sanctioned by a certain kind of Christianity that is really empire Christianity. It does nothing but love power. It, uh, it is very uh, 
uh, macho and very masculine in its nature. And it is very fundamentalist and, and it, it enforces a status quo kind of value system. On the other hand, there's a faith movement that has always been a resistance to the status quo. It's already always been a faithful resistance to empire religion. Uh, and so when he walked out there and held up his Bible in front of the church, it was a statement to that empire religion uh, to, uh, to, uh, that we're still together. Uh, we, we, we're gonna fight to hold on to this thing. We're gonna fight uh, to return me to office because we know that's what he's talking about. Uh, but he held up that Bible in which to solidify that very racist base, that clan or originating base. Somebody might get upset with that, but that's, the, that's really the nature of, uh, of religion. We've always had a religion that preached, slaves be obedient to your master. We always had a religion that preached uh, that secular authority has been appointed by God. And I hear people all the time, particularly that Mr. Pillow guy, uh, saying that this man in the White House has been elected and ordained by God. And, I, and I'm putting that out there because you got one of them pillars, burn it. You got one of those pillars, throw them out of your house, right? Don't buy one. Uh, and, 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 and that's a part of the sort of the struggle that we're engaged in when they talk about cultural wars. It's not culture, it's ideology. It's an ideological war. It's a war of theology. It's a war uh, in order for those of us who believe in inclusion and those of us who believe in, in hearing one another and respecting one another versus those who wanna control the world and bend the world towards their own ideology and their own understanding and their own greed because it's not just bending it to their ideology. It's, it's, it's also bending the world into a kind of paradigm where they can steal everything they want, including lands and culture and resources. So that's the battle. So he stood up there and, and basically tapped into his ideological base, uh, which uh, we have to struggle against and, and, and deal with. Uh, Brother Cornell West uh, talked about, uh, calls uh, the president a neo-fascist gangster. So you were you, you were gentle compared to Brother Cornell. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, let's, um, let, let's return now to the reason why the people are out in the streets. And uh, I, I want you to say a word about uh, George Floyd. Uh, already in the 1980s, you were an outspoken critic of, and earlier than that, Chicago's and Boston's police departments, gang control tactics, uh, involving the searching of young black men on the streets without a warrant or probable cause. Uh, uh, you became vice president of the Massachusetts Civil Liberties Union. Now we add the names of Breonna Taylor, Ahmad Arbery, uh, and George Floyd to an ever growing list. I mean, it's an ever growing list, right? Of uh, African-American men and women who've been killed sleeping while black, jogging while black, shopping while black. Talk to us about, talk to us about the systemic racism and rage uh, that really this, this, this latest, this latest murder really of George, uh, of George Floyd where it's caught on video camera uh, that's sweeping the country. And, and that's the issue. These are the names we know. There are thousands of names that we don't know. Yeah. There are folks who exactly. got away with the victimization and the murder of people. When I arrived in Boston in 1981, I was there a few months before I ended up being locked up and charged with about 15 charges, one including attempted murder uh, and uh, of a police officer, I might add. Uh, and, uh, and I was on trial for the next year uh, and a hand. And, and, and one of the things that got me was that after I originally got out of jail, got ball, bailed out, I'm home and I turn on TV and I watching the news and the district attorney goes on the air live and says that we have a very dangerous person an outside agitator who's pretending to be clergy that we're gonna get 45 years at max, max security prison on him. He was referring to me. Uh, and so that when the fight was on and I realized that they were serious uh, and, and what was going on was that we were doing a lot of racial justice organizing then, in the midst of illegal police searches in the midst of whites really just patrolling the streets of Boston 
and jumping on black families and beating black couples and bleeding, beating black, black individuals uh, and nobody ever going to jail, nobody ever being locked up for that. And so we started opposing it. We started organizing around it. And that was their message back to me was, we're going to show you how we can handle you. Well, you know, God is always a great God because they didn't handle me too well. Uh, and I ended up walking out of that courtroom, like I said, a year and a half uh, later, uh, totally uh, exonerated. Um, but, you know, it's those types of things uh, because I could have easily been in max, max security prison. A uh, guy, when I was doing prison um, ministry in Walpole, which is max security prison, just called me like a month ago. And, and, and he called me to tell me this. He says, Rev, he says, there's not a day that has gone by that I've not thought about you and you're the first call I'm making, I'm out. He had been in for 45 years. Oh my. 45 years for something that he did not do. And when he finally was able 45 years later to get a new trial, the evidence that was there wasn't there. And it also came out that they had trumped up testimony against him to put him away. And, 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 so, and so I'm raising all this because that's how it takes place. So, you know, in, in, in the NAACP uh, years ago, 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, used to hang a, hang a flag out, out of their headquarters that say, yesterday a man was lynched uh, in response to the lynchings that were taking place all around the country to remind people that people were actually being lynched, not in the paper anywhere, not recorded anywhere. Folks didn't have um, uh, telephone cameras, uh, all those types of things. I mean, so things took place in such a way um, to uh, try to, uh, in a sense, intimidate and keep black folks in the place. I was just looking through a newspaper article and an old newspaper article post, and it was so interesting, the attitude, and it showed you the attitude. Oscar DePriest gets elected on the south side of Chicago to Congress, uh, and he gets elected because of really the migration from the South into places like Chicago that created a very large black community. And so he's the first one pretty much, the first one since reconstruction to be returned to Congress. And the president's wife or something invited uh, the wives of Congress people to the White House for luncheon. And, uh, and of course, Oscar DePriest's wife was in that crowd, which I don't think the president's uh, first lady realized it, but invited her. And, uh, and she went. And there was a senator from South Carolina that was quoted in the Washington Post said, now we got to lynch a thousand of them to put them back in their place. That's the mentality. Uh, it, and, and so what I'm getting at is that it's only being caught on camera now. It's only coming to light right now. But this is the stuff that Black folks have been dealing with historically. Uh, you know, it's, as somebody said, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're not only got to hold our breath uh, from the pandemic. We got to hold our breath around cops. We got to hold our breath around all kinds of institutionalized racism. We got to hold our breath around white supremacy and we got to hold our breath now more than ever. And so finally, 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 we particularly got young folks who are breathing, who are showing us all how to breathe, showing us all how to walk across this country, move across this country, wake up this country and try to deliver something of worth to this country. So we've been playing games around racism and white supremacy for years. I want to I want to ask you about the pandemic in a minute, but uh, uh, I want to return to what you said just a few minutes ago. You know, just as you said that there are many Christianities uh, present within Christian history, some that have been life affirming, many that have been life negating. Uh, the, likewise, have been there, there have been different Americas. And the America that we're seeing now with Black Hawk helicopters deployed in the nation's capital and armed military uh, uh, supplementing local police. Um, th this vision of America, this comp these competing visions of America have dominated our discourse in the, last, uh, in the last number of years, but particularly under this president. Well, this president is up front with it. Uh, that's, that's the only difference because it has been here just about with every other president that you've had uh, who've had no carriage 
with which to take on uh, uh, white supremacy or dismantle the policies of race and racism, or even challenge this ideological perspective. And it's not only just the ideological perspective that's dangerous on the right, but a lot of white folks who consider themselves in the middle are filled with just as much racism and bias and prejudice uh, as possible, misconceptions about black folks and people of color. And one of the things that I always point out is that if you're black or you're Latino, uh, you generally have to go into a white community to work, to survive. So you have to learn how to speak their language a little bit. You have to learn the sensibilities of their culture a little bit. You have to work in close proximity to them. It doesn't happen the other way around. White folks very seldom come into black or Latino communities and have to walk around them and learn to speak the language and learn about the cultural sensitivity. And so what happens is that all around us, all around us, there is a continual diet of white supremacist ideology. Just turn on your TV any particular night. Look at any TV show. The stereotypes are there. Uh, the stereotypes are there and the good cop is there. The stereotypes are there and the anti-terrorism is there. Uh, uh, you know, and, and so, so in a sense, you know, we've gotten very militarized in our own thinking, cultural, enculturated with what is present, presented to us uh, through mass media. And, and we're never very critical about it. We don't think about what we're actually uh, being fed a diet. Yeah. Let's say a word. You mentioned the, uh, um, we're, we're going to come back to uh, um, talking about the issues of racial justice. In fact, maybe they're over related, they're uh, uh, interrelated here. Uh, while we've been talking about, you know, Breonna Taylor and Ahmad Arbery and George Floyd, we're still dealing with the COVID pandemic uh, and, the, and, and uh, uh, with, with more than 107,000 dead in our country, uh, which the president now is more than willing to ignore. You've been, a, you've been an advocate for uh, racial justice, for workers' rights your entire life. One of the things that's offended me the most is the way those on the political and the religious right account that some lives are worth more than others so we can reopen the country. In other words, some lives are more expendable. And I guess I wanna ask you, how, how has the pandemic, this is, this is poor people's campaign language now, how has the pandemic exposed the fissures that were already present in American society, but, may, but actually exposed them as even greater than we once thought. Well, I can almost talk, I can talk from a very personal experience because I've had about 20 funerals since this pandemic started. Um, and uh, it has been members who were exposed because they were in the kinds of jobs that they could not work remotely. Uh, you know, everybody wants to talk about underlying conditions and yeah, that's, that's somewhat true. But you know, when you start talking about uh, a lot of poor communities, uh, immigrant communities, um, you find you got folks who are working in convalescent homes, nursing homes, uh, and uh, they are not able to uh, uh, do social distancing. Um, and uh, you know, we had uh, one young man uh, die. This young man, he was in his fifties, uh, a um, immigrant from uh, Cameroon, and we've been fighting that he could be able to stay in the United States because they had issued his deportation orders more than once, only to be, die now because the job he had was a job that he was there in the midst without protection and nobody seemed to care. So I've had funeral after funeral of people who've been exposed and older folks who've been exposed um, um, and, uh, and have died. You know, one of the things is that um, um, in, in Washington, DC, uh, the city is broken down into wards and one of the quote unquote affluent wards tends to be ward four, or at least everybody thinks so. Ward four is also a very heavily black ward, and it's also a very heavily elderly ward. And, and what they found out in this pandemic, that in this so-called affluent ward, it has led the city in contagion and comes only second to the poorest ward in the city. Uh, so, wow. so it just it just continues to demonstrate to you that you, you talk about you talk about racial disparity. Uh, and, uh, and you talk about racial disparity in terms of who has um, contracted the, the, um, the virus and who has died from the virus. And it's just very clear to me that um, 
Uh, this is not a hypothetical thing, and it's not uh, something that, that I need to sort of um, create theories and hypotheses around because I've been too busy burying folks. Tell us a little bit more about uh, your ministry, uh, especially in this with, with the funerals uh, uh, and the ministry to the families in this time of pandemic. Well, it's, it's rough, particularly at the beginning, because families were not able to be present with their loved ones as their loved ones made their transition. Um, if, the, if the medical staff wasn't too busy, uh, somebody um, um, may have taken the opportunity, and they, in a couple instances they did, to, um, to do a FaceTime with uh, the family members as the person passed on. Uh, but by and large, most of those uh, people who passed on um, passed on alone, uh, and um, and family members um, had to have um, funerals for them, um, and some of them didn't have funerals for them. Some of them just cremated because there was no place to go. The funeral homes were backed up uh, with uh, with bodies, and so that could not be scheduled at all. I've done a few um, um, uh, funerals at the church, uh, and where we uh, live streamed it so that people could actually see the service and participate in it in that way. Uh, but it's very difficult because you got uh, families who are, have a, uh, a real loss and, and, and don't necessarily have a sense of closure. Speaking about your ministry, Graylin, um, have you ever had to have uh, the talk with any of your young members? Yeah. You want to you wanna say a word about that? Well, I mean, and, and it's something that's actively being discussed and has been discussed, uh, um, you know, particularly uh, my young, young men uh, sit down because we'll always have a few of them who get in trouble. A lot of them, some of them, most of them got in trouble undeservedly, I might point out, just picked up on the street corner, singled out for some, whatever reason by the police. And the next thing they know, they got some type of charge against them, which always then triggers the discussion that you're going to have with a larger group uh, to uh, try to get folks to understand what just happened, uh, how they can avoid it, how they uh, um, uh, can, can uh, basically protect themselves in a very hostile world. Uh, I was just thinking, I was remembering a story in um, my parents, in, I was born and raised in Baltimore. My parents bought a store uh, after the 68 riots uh, and it was uh, the store that, um, that we had um, a credit in. They called it the book. You know, you put it in the book until payday, then you come back and you pay off the bill. Uh, it was after the riots that uh, people decided to leave the city in this mass exodus, and my parents bought that store on the corner. And it was a few years into that that uh, my father decided that he was going to go out and buy uh, a Lincoln Continental. And you got to remember, up until that point, we had used... Fords and used Plymouths and stuff that uh, they got off some used car lot somewhere. So he went out and bought it. That was his first new, first new car. So we all went out, obviously, to pick it up. So we drive it off the lot. I don't think we've gone six blocks. Police pulls us over and says, routine check. And that's what they used to do to Black folks in Baltimore, was that they see you in a car, it was routine check because it was to harass you all along the way. And so, you know, and so it's clear that you, we, we got to talk to our young folks because um, that was just raw and then, but, but now it takes place in terms of jump outs, what's called jump outs in DC. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. I'm uh, not, please uh, explain it to us. You on the, you're on the street corner, maybe talking to um, your, your peers uh, and all of a sudden the unmarked car pulls up and cops jump out and pull guns on you and shake you down on the corner. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, if you got anything on you, then you're locked up, that type of stuff. They're called, they're called jump outs. Well, the police here claimed, we had a meeting with them a while back, claimed, well, we don't have, we don't do jump outs, and da 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 and they kept trying to explain that. And so finally, we had to say to them, say, look, I don't care what you call. You've got cops in an unmarked car jumping out on kids and shaking them down instantly and locking them up. I said, you can call that Mickey Mouse. I don't care, but you need to stop it. And uh, that has been a bone of contention because they deny that it's happening all the time. And of course, we see it all the time. Those are the types of things that folks deal with on a daily, daily uh, basis. 
We're speaking today with Pastor Graylin Hagler, Washington, D.C., uh, activist uh, and advocate for racial justice and Palestinian rights. I'd encourage those of you who are on the interview via Zoom, uh, if you have questions for our guests, please uh, submit them through the chat function at the bottom of the page. Uh, I'm monitoring that and be happy to pass them along uh, to our guests. Uh, Graylin, um, let me let me ask you about uh, um, uh, a brother, uh, uh, a UCC clergyman, uh, Otis Moss III from Chicago. Uh, has come out recently with a couple of uh, video films, one of which he named after James Cone's book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, a requiem for Ahmad Arbery. And then his next one was a sermon where he talked about uh, the hymn, uh, the great uh, uh, charge in the African-American community, we shall overcome. In uh, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, he referred to the COVID not 19 uh, uh, virus, but the COVID-1619 uh, virus. And uh, uh, in the, uh, the second sermon, when he was talking about we shall overcome someday, he asked the question, when will be the someday that we shall overcome? Do you have a response to either one of these from your brother UCC pastor, Otis Moss III? I've, I've heard about it, I have not seen them yet, uh, those pieces. But um, one of the things I, I immediately respond this way, I, I do uh, on, on part of the time I take off or try to take off from the church, I do what's called a walk, for me, I call it a walkabout. And a walkabout is I go to some place that pulls at my soul in a particular way. And uh, this past year, my walkabout took me down to Point Comfort, Virginia. And Point Comfort is where that ship arrived in 1690. It later became a fort, Fort Monroe there. Uh, but that was one of the places where my spirit took me to just stand on that ground. Uh, and then I went over to Southampton County, Virginia. And y'all familiar what happened in Southampton County, Virginia. That was the Nat Turner uprising. Uh, Nat Turner was a plantation preacher. Uh, and, uh, and basically uh, it was because of partly his vision, his revelation that led him to not only organize people into a rebellion, but to lead that rebellion that closed down the entire Southern lands for a while because everybody was afraid that there was going to be more and more slave rebellions that were going to take place. Uh, so that's a part of my sort of ex my own personal experience of walking those sacred grounds. And also realizing this is that, and this is kind of a struggle I think for all of us, is we always wanna talk about nonviolence, but how do you remain nonviolent in a violent context? How do you remain nonviolent when no one seems to care? How do you remain nonviolent in that kind of setting? Uh, because it requires a kind of revolutionary spirit at times. You know, so everybody was calling me up when young folks were out there looting stuff and wanting me to come out and condemn it. And I said, I will not. I will not condemn it. Uh, and the reason I won't condemn it is simply because when people are angry and people are outraged and nobody seems to have been listening and we've been marching for decades uh, for uh, 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 hundreds of years in one form or fashion, struggling in one way or another, and still we're in the same place, um, then, uh, and, that, and that's the frustration that young folks feel, and they are responding. When we're talking about two separate churches, you know, one was in, in Nazi Germany, you had uh, Hitler that purged the seminaries and purged the universities of people and voices that were not sympathetic to uh, Nazism. That's why we ended up in that period of a whole lot of German theologians in American seminaries, uh, and, uh, because they were fleeing Germany and coming into places like Union and places like that. But there was the Confessing Church of Germany, the Confessing Church of Germany that decided that enough was enough and they set a bomb under Hitler's conference table. 
didn't, did not succeed, but it was that confessing church of Germany. Dietrich Bonhoeffer dies uh, uh, on the last days of the war. Or I can point out another preacher, John Brown, right, who leads the rebellion into Harpers Ferry, but also out in Lawrence, Kansas, first, uh, who had brought with him a lot of the seminary trained black folks out of Oberlin Seminary, Oberlin Theological School at that point, who went and walked with him and fought with him and died with him. Uh, but, you know, these were the kinds of struggles. So we got to raise the question sometimes of maybe we're being too superficial in our approach to things. And I'm not advocating violence or bombing or shooting, but I'm pointing out issues in history that change the course of history. Because the Civil War really started with John Brown. John Brown fired those first shots of that Civil War. What kind of uh, resistance do you uh, promote among your people and in the marches and protests that you uh, uh, speak at? Um, talk to us a little bit about that kind of resistance movement of which you're a part. Well, one is we got to get out of the mentality of reforming. And we got to look at thorough restructuring uh, and, and, and demythologizing. Yeah, because yeah, we're yeah. all built yeah. on this mythology of America being benevolent and all of that other type of stuff. And then we so conveniently forget about the histories where people had to fight and die because their government attacked them. You know, I think about the, uh, the miners in, 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 in Colorado organizing for fair wage and Rockefeller uh, has the governor call out the National Guard on them and they are killed and burned alive. Uh, in their barracks, all those other types of things, uh, the uh, attempts at, uh, um, uh, you know, the attempts at uh, bridging free speech, uh, which uh, Wobblies had to challenge free speech all over the country. Uh, I mean, we, we've had these kinds of fascist things uh, over and over again. So it's a part of us, I think we need to remember history because the solution for where we are comes out of our understanding of history, what was done before, uh, what types of models and paradigms that are put in place that we have to oppose and destruct and deconstruct, the things that we have to demo uh, demythologize. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a prime example. We don't look at language enough and the use of language. I don't refer to myself as an African-American, for example. My people didn't come through Ellis Island. My people came through Sullivan's Island in South Carolina on an auction block down there, where my parent, my group, folks on my mother's side was on the same plantation for about 200 years. So, uh, so I'm not an African-American. I might be an African in the diaspora, but I'm definitely a black person, which is a political term and a political perspective. One that is not at ease in America. One that refuses to be at ease in America and a person that refused to trust the systems of America where the systems of America are contaminated and need to be dismantled. I'm so glad you brought this up, uh, uh, Graylin. I mean, you're, you're singing our song here. Uh, uh, I referred to him earlier, but uh, uh, Brother Cornell West uh, uh, says that uh, recently in an interview said that, quote, America is a failed social experiment because, quote, its capitalist economy could not generate and deliver in such a way people can live lives of decency. The nation state, its criminal justice system, its legal system could not generate protection of rights and liberties. Our culture is so market driven, everybody for sale, everything for sale, you can't deliver the kind of really real nourishment for soul, for meaning, for purpose. I'm I'm guessing you agree with him. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I do. America is a failed social experiment because of what you just uh, uh, laid out for us and what Brother West lays out for us. Yeah, but I would say that America is not a failed social uh, ex experiment. It has been very successful. <laughs> because it's tried it, to achieve. It, right, it was conceived in greed and it was conceived in elite colonial settler privilege, where basically those feudal powers in Europe originally gave huge tracts of land to folks who were loyal to them. And they drove off and slaughtered and 
practice genocide against native populations in order to clear that land. And then that land was so large that they could not work it except through folks stolen out of Africa and enslaved in this country to work it. That's what made America wealthy. Not some Wall Street genius or some financier. It was free labor. Free labor that came through that whole system of enslavement and robbery of lands. Uh, that's what took place. You know, it, it's interesting. We remember the mortgage crisis. Uh, you know, when, when, when they were doing paper and uh, junk yeah. paper and people couldn't pay back loans. But one of the ways in which was happening, particularly at the Louisiana Purchase, when that took place and there was new territories and new native populations to push off the land, uh, uh, all of the financial community basically created a formula of how much cotton could a hand pick. And therefore they lent money to the first person to buy slaves based on how much money, a hand, or how much uh, cotton a hand could pick. And so you got 100% finance for your land and for those enslaved people. And then when the bottom dropped out, people began to understand that they had bundled those loans and they had sold them to the world markets in Europe, in the UK, in Germany, and places like that. And the market went belly up just like it did during the mortgage crisis because they were doing the same thing with land and human lives. And that's where the gone to Texas ordinances came about. You know about the gone to Texas ordinance? Because the states trying to protect those rogues landowners and those rogue slaveholders invented uh, pieces of legislature all through the South that basically was able to say to the banks, sorry, you can't collect your no loan, we're gone to Texas. Ah. So you could go to Texas while you were sitting in Louisiana, for example. And, uh, and, and so that became a part of the deal that was set aside, uh, again, built upon corruption, built upon greed, built upon thievery. Uh, those are the models of America that exist. So America has been very successful, has been very successful in exporting population after population after population. You know, every single immigrant group that arrives usually find out that they're kicked in the butt, kicked around, exploited. Uh, but the difference is, is when you come from Europe, because of your pigmentation, the next generation, you'll be white and you'll be kicking everybody else's butt. Uh, and, and that's a part, but that cannot happen for folks of black and brown descent. It does not happen for folks of black and brown descent. We are not part of America. We are the conscience of America. That's the difference. You know, uh, uh, I, I hear a lot of people or see a lot of people saying amen in the, in the, uh, on the screen here, Graylin. Um, when you talk about uh, black people being the conscience of America and America not, as Brother West says, a failed social experiment, but successful in its exploitation of greed, uh, this sounds, you and I were talking about this before we came on the interview about the 1619 Project which is something that my Tuesday morning class had, had, uh, had been reading in. Uh, 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 how, the first, how the first Africans had been brought to this country uh, uh, in 1619 uh, to Virginia and how American economy, healthcare, education system, criminal justice system and more had been built upon the backs of mostly negatively <laughs> of uh, 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 the, the African, the black presence in our country, even before its founding. And so you're singing Nicole Hannah Jones, uh, the New York Times uh, uh, reviews, uh, 1619 project, you're singing that song. Well, just, I mean, just think about it, you know, when you look at, I'll bring up almost contemporary, six years ago, as uh, Ferguson, Missouri blew up. You know, you had all white police force, all black community. Uh, it was discovered that basically the black community was subsidizing the budget of the police department because the police department was writing all kinds of tickets, all kinds of court appearances, all kinds of basically extracting money from the black community to fund the police department to oppress them. Right. So it's, 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 it's a kind of ridiculous formula, but it's real and it's been practiced throughout time and over and over again. Uh, you know, that's what that's what Gandhi was talking about when Gandhi was sitting there with his spinning wheel and uh, and, and, and wearing and wearing his uh, his home spot, because what was going on all over India, and this shows you how racism 
white supremacy work. What was going on all over India is that Indians were being pushed to pick cotton. And then that cotton was shipped to textile mills in the UK. And then they were forced to buy back the cotton in India, though India had produced the cotton in the first place. So that's when, in, in, in Gandhi's revolutionary experience, that's why he was sitting there with the spinning wheel, because basically he was taking the own raw materials and producing them there. And that's when he was talking about self-sufficiency in India. And so, again, a sort of understanding models to begin to deconstruct those models and to demythologize those models and to yeah. create a, a, a new understanding of what we have to do and, and how we have to do it. Um, and now Ferguson, uh, Missouri uh, has, hire, has elected its first uh, woman mayor, its first African-American mayor, just in the last uh, a few days. Uh, and, and uh, black police chief. And, and black police chief as well, that's correct. Uh, we've got a question from uh, one, one of the folks in our viewing audience here. Have police tactics become harsher since 9-11? Well, police tactics have become more technologically advanced since 9-11. When I was little, like I said, in Baltimore, one of the, um, the initiation of rookies would ride in the back of the lockup wagon whenever a black man got locked up. And what they would do, they would beat that person senseless in the back of the wagon and they would get uh, blood over them. And that was a rookie's initiation into the Baltimore Police Department. And uh, I remember that there was a shootout on our, my neighborhood. It was a, I lived in a neighborhood where we had some characters that, uh, that uh, did stuff like clockwork. And so there was a shootout this particular July night uh, between a husband and a wife. And just so that you don't think that the, just the husband was shooting, both of them were shooting. Uh, and they came and they um, locked him up. And uh, they were good friends living three, two doors away. And my father said to the cop, and you better not hit him. You know, seeing the rookie get in the back of the car. And they turned to my father and said, you can get some of that too, if you want. But that was probably, and so when we got went to get him on the other side, to bail him out, of course, his eyes had been beaten shut. His teeth were missing, had been knocked out of his head. Uh, he had been beaten, uh, and so that's that. That was just a, that was just the ritual. When when Freddie Gray happened, I was not surprised because they were still doing what they had been doing, except that it was nobody in the back of the lockup wagon. But they were doing hard turns and bumps, basically trying to shake the person up in the back and kill them. I mean, those are the types of things that were going on. So, police tactics have been police tactics. They use the tools at their disposal, and the tools are always harsh. And I'm afraid, you know, because we were all afraid, and I'm using quotation marks, all afraid of terrorists in 9-11, we allowed them to pass the Patriot Act, which created more surveillance, yeah. which created more technical oppression, technological oppression. Uh, and, and that's what happens every time that we are afraid of something or they stir us up into that hysteria of fear, is we allow more and more of uh, our rights to erode and for people basically to get greater control over us. Graylin, in addition to your work for racial justice in our country, you've also been an outspoken advocate uh, in the Palestinian struggle for human rights and political rights. I want to be very sensitive here because I don't want to step on, uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to, um, uh, the issue of racial justice uh, the systemic racism and the maltreatment and murder of black women and men and youth by the state to be over, overlooked or to be co-opted. Nevertheless, we can't talk about police departments, military use of force and police training in our country without making the connection to Israel and Israel's treatment of Palestinians. One of the questions that's been asked is, uh, 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 refers to the issue of Israeli police training U.S. police forces uh, uh, and the idea of applying pressure on the next that, that's something taught by the Israeli military to police forces in the U.S. You're in a good position, you're in a good position to, to maybe talk about this with us, Grayla, Grayland, since you straddle both issues mm -hmm. uh, and you've been involved with them for many, many decades. Say yeah. a word about say a word about how the, the parallels here. 
Well, we know there's exchanges that take place in terms of Israelis' uh, uh, law enforcement and Israeli military uh, training uh, U.S. military and U.S. law enforcement uh, on, on tactics of control, on supposedly anti-terrorism. Uh, and the issue becomes, we don't know if, uh, if this knee on the neck originated in, in Israel or originated in the U.S. or originated wherever they're putting people down. Uh, but one thing we know is that this knee in the neck has become a universal tactic of suppression. Of, uh, of, of subduing somebody, of, of, of particularly those that you do not think as human, uh, that you put your knee in your neck and you inflict the greatest kind of harm, the greatest kind of pain. And so that has been clearly what has been going on in the occupied territories of Palestine by carried out by the occupiers, Israelis. Uh, and, uh, and that's what's going on in the United States. And so it's no small coincidence, people weren't trying to steal anything when Palestinians stood up in solidarity with what's going on in this country right now, because Palestinians understood at a very visceral level uh, what it means because they have been going through that same type of situation in the occupied territories in Palestine. And, uh, and so there's a great kind of affinity and relationship. And again, I'm gonna get back to the right wing church. That's the, what the right wing church don't want uh, people to identify with is that there is this affinity that exists between people of color, black folks, and struggling Palestine, just that, just like there was an affinity that existed between uh, black folks in the United States and in the world, and black folks in South Africa, uh, because it is the same kind of condition that replicates itself. I mean, I think that uh, it's uh, it's a number of years ago when we were there. Uh, I think it was 2016 um, with a group of black preachers. Uh, we went to uh, the refugee camp right outside of Bethlehem. Uh, some of you probably were there at some time. And we went there, we were asked to come there because we were with preachers and they wanted to dedicate a monument that, uh, that playgrounds for Palestine uh, had helped to uh, fund. And so we went there, it was a rainy day, it was a rainstorm. Uh, and we went out there to the playground and the playground, uh, the monument there was dedicated uh, to a 12 year old boy that was playing soccer and was shot by Israeli uh, snipers who were actually obviously, because there was nothing going on. So they were just shooting for fun, probably seeing who could hit this young boy and they killed him. And the other side of the monument was to Tamir Rice who was a kid that in the playground that the police rolled up on Cleveland in Cleveland, didn't say nothing, jumped out of the car and just shot. I know that shrine, it's in the Dehesha camp, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, the Dehesha refugee camp on the outskirts of Bethlehem. Right. Um, there's, a, there's a question uh, about uh, how to uh, um, mobilize and improve the Palestinian church leaders within the African-American clergy. You just referred to the trip that you took in 2016 with African-American clergy, friends of yours from the DC area and others. Uh, but it is a concern, is it not? Uh, maybe it's theological or maybe it's political, but say a word about how to mobilize even more strongly within African-American church, in particular among its clergy. Well, I mean, one of the things is that and you know this because seminary conditions folks, seminary conditions folks not to think outside the box. They hear about the glories of Israel over and over and over again, Zion all over and over again. And they're never taught to be critical that that was then and probably didn't exist then, uh, but it was a concept in somebody's mind and not necessarily a, a, a real territory, a real land. Um, you got to go back and look archeolo archeologically to sort of come to those conclusions. Um, but, uh, but we get caught up in this type of thing as if somehow Israel and Zion uh, is ordained by God. Um, we, 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 we buy into the language that uh, um, this is uh, uh, the people of God, the chosen of God. We just listen to the exclusive language that we use in all of this stuff. Uh, and, 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 and what I'm raising is that, am I not chosen by God? Are you not chosen by God? Are we not chosen by God? 
that is a statement of inclusion rather than a statement of exclusion. And then we got to teach preachers that God is not in the real estate business and God is not a homicidal, homicidal maniac either. Uh, and so, uh, and so, you know, the issue becomes for me is where do we recognize the, 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 the clarion call of the prophets that continue to warn the people, take away from me the sound of your hearts, right? What is required of us but to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly without God. Well, Amos says, take away from me all of your rituals, all of your rites, all of your sacrifices, all of that stuff I will not look upon, but let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Somehow, somehow we avoid the absolute meaning of those texts. And we go for this glib theology that tends to prop up the status quo, tend to uh, uh, be, become um, uh, we become proclaimers of the status quo, uh, and we do not question what is going on and think that is all ordained by God because it says so in the Bible. We do we do uncritical reading of our scripture. Our mutual buddy uh, Steve France uh, from D.C. wants to uh, ask you about uh, Clarence Thomas's type of black nationalism. Uh, you want to say a word about that, Clarence? Who? <laughs> Clarence Thomas, Justice Clarence Thomas. Yeah, Clarence Thomas is an assimilist. Uh, he is a part of the system and he's proud to be a part of the system. He will never side with black folks. And in fact, his arguments to use are circular argument and he knows that they're a circular argument. Uh, his stance against affirmative action, for example, was because uh, the way white folks would look on him. Um, you know, my attitude was, I don't care whether I got there by affirmative action or whatever, I'm there now, you have to deal with me, right? And I'm gonna take and do the best with what I got. Uh, so who cares how somebody looks upon me? I know who I am, I know what I have, I know what God gave to me, and I'm strong enough to stand and deal with any situation. Uh, and that does not come out of my own arrogance. That comes out of trusting in God and being a child of God, and knowing that God has had my back all along the way. Everything I've been in, God brought me out and God brought me through, and I'm just going to give praise to God. And so Clarence Thomas, you know, ought to be ashamed of himself. Uh, he, he, he's, he's like uh, the house person that walks up to the slave master and says, are we sick today, master? He's got to wait until the master tells them that he's sick in order for him to be sick. You were very gentle there. Uh, um, uh, uh, we appreciate that. <laughs> I've got two more questions. Uh, um, already, uh, um, uh, like I say, in, in, the, in the 80s, you were involved in um, workers' rights um, the poor people's campaign, I guess I want us to talk about that because uh, uh, you're the uh, Washington, D.C. co-chair. The poor people's campaign uh, has really become a national, a mass national movement coalescing under one umbrella, a real broad coalition of organizations working for justice. Uh, June 20, 2020, the Poor People's Campaign will be ho uh, holding their virtual march, their virtual march on Washington, D.C. Uh, the original dates of, of the, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the real march that has had to be uh, 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 made virtual because of the physical distancing of the pandemic. So I want you to talk a little bit about uh, your involvement in the Poor People's Campaign and why on June the 20th, we should all be online participating in the virtual march on Washington of the Poor People's Campaign? Well, you already expressed it that originally. It was to bring people to Washington, D.C. on June 20th, 2020, uh, to basically show up as uh, a Poor People's Campaign called for more revival. They've been organizing all over the country and basically uh, working and going into poor communities to uh, lift up the voices of those uh, poor and struggling folks in those communities. 
operating upon a premise that there's a whole host of issues that feed into a larger overall umbrella of issues. And, 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 and that is when we look at economic justice or we look at healthcare or the lack of it. Uh, we, we look at uh, income disparity. We look at uh, uh, gender issues. We look at uh, uh, sexual preference issues. I mean, the fact is, is that all of these things that are going on uh, and the oppression that people are receiving because of uh, them, them stems from the same agents of greed, the same agents of oppression, folks who want to keep people down. Uh, and so it doesn't stop with hatred against LGBTQIA people. It also doesn't stop with uh, hatred against black people. It doesn't stop with hatred against uh, uh, immigrants or hatred against Latinx. It doesn't stop with hatred against women. It, do, it just continues and it continues and continues because it all comes out of the same format and the same model. And so what 2020 was intended to do was to bring people together from all these different streams, from Native American folks to stand up and talk about the issues of water rights and talk about the issue of land rights, uh, to people talking about income disparity, the people talking about uh, uh, um, the, the attacks upon the environment in general and all the other issues, voting rights and militarism and uh, where our money goes. And, and so we're trying to make this the biggest virtual march that has ever happened on the 20th. If you have not gone, you can go to Poor People's Campaign and you can sign up there to make sure that you get all the ways and notifications in order to be a part of that. Uh, but it's going to be something, and, and hopefully uh, it's something that as we have been building it over time, will continue to go forth in time and, 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 and maybe do something about this depressing place that we're in as a country. I want to return quickly to the unrest that's happening in Washington, D.C. La this last uh, week and a half, Graylin. And I, I'm not quite sure, quite sure how to put this because I'm not a D.C. resident, but it strikes me that there might be some friction between the D.C. police under the you know, under the authority of uh, Mayor Bowser and the federal militarized uh, uh, forces under the attorney general that are kind of stepping on the toes and stepping into the jurisdiction of the D.C. police and that those two entities might police the protesters differently. Am I wrong? Am I right? I mean, talk to, talk, I, I don't understand, you know, that kind of internal DC politics very well, but 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 talk to us a little bit about that in well, regards to in regards to the protests. Well, those are not we're not from the area. Washington DC is a colony. Um, we exist really at the permission of Congress, uh, and uh, basically uh, we have no uh, we don't have voting representation in Congress whatsoever, and so it's a it's a federal district. Uh, under our limited home rule, which was negotiated, uh, we were able to basically set up a metropolitan police force that was no longer a federal employed force. And, uh, and as well as fire department that came to DC uh, uh, proper. Uh, so, so that set up a battle for the battle that we're having now, uh, because you got limited home rule and you got local leaders that stand in the way of, uh, of um, somebody trying to federalize local police. Uh, and that becomes a, a, a struggle in itself. Uh, that's why they wanted to call in National Guard and troops from other jurisdictions and other bases around um, the, uh, the country because they could not get necessarily the cooperation from DC, uh, the full cooperation that they wanted from DC. And they really couldn't get it from Virginia either, I need to point out. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so that was a whole nother struggle, a whole nother issue. Uh, but then again, in these types of crises, it, it really highlights these types of uh, issues. And here in D.C., the whole colonial status of D.C. is amplified up under uh, this crisis again. Now, yeah. let, me, let, me, let me also point this out. Sure. Because this, this points to that whole struggle around military and police. Yeah. In D.C., a number of years ago, they passed a regulation that basically said that if you wanted to get on the police department, you had to complete two years of college. 
or the way to get around two years of college is to go away to the military and then come back and you can apply. And in fact, you get preferential treatment applying coming back from the military. So that automatically begins to set up the militarization of your police department. And people, what makes DC so desirous is because if you come to DC, you get on the Metropolitan Police Department, then you got a shot of being local enough that you can become Secret Service maybe, you can become Capitol Police maybe, you can become FBI maybe. All, all, these, all these different police departments that exist uh, in Washington, D.C., Supreme Court police. You know, Supreme Court got their own police. I found that out when I got locked up at the Supreme Court uh, yeah. a couple of years ago, right? Uh, they got their own, the Supreme Court got their own police chief, I need to point out. Uh, I mean, so, so you, you be, and then the FBI got a, a FBI police on top of the FBI. Uh, <laughs> to protect the FBI stuff, right? I mean, so this is give you a crazy idea of just how crazy this town is in terms of all of the different law enforcement agencies that exist up under law enforcement agencies. Now, I lifted that story because what happens is that you get a police force that more and more does not look like the people they're patrolling. You got a police force that more and more knows nothing about the neighborhoods in which they're patrolling or the people that live in those neighborhoods. Absolutely. They did not, they did not come out of those neighborhoods. They don't, they, they don't even know the culture of those neighborhoods. So they come in as it was some militaristic mindset to come in and keep people, quote unquote, in their place. Uh, and that's been the sort of strained relationship over and over again that we have seen. Now, I, when I'm on picket line, I talk to officers all the time, introduce myself. But it's always been interesting that the, the, the black officers and the Latino officers, they always say stuff like this to me. Rev, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hang on to my 20 years come because I'm out of here. I'm a retired here. This is as racist as can be. Now, these are your cops complaining about the racism of the cops. And, uh, and, and it never fails. I get into that conversation with cops all the time who just particularly can't wait to leave because it's changed. The culture has changed because you could come up, you could grow up uh, in the past, you could grow up in, let's say, Berry Farm housing projects. And, and, and graduate from high school and then apply to become a cop and get your and get accepted, get your training, right? And make your way out of the housing projects and raise your family up to a middle-class status uh, in your generation. I mean, that's what was cut off to all these neighborhood kids. I can't let you go today I, I, without this uh, last question. And then I'll give you a chance to, to, to close with this, but uh, we're in an election year. And we know that the president and his supporters in the political and religious right have been a disaster for marginalized populations. Uh, but we also know that e even though in comparison, the Democratic Party and Joe Biden is heavily supported among African Americans and other peoples of color, nevertheless, uh, within the mainline wing of the party, for decades, there's much more to be expected than what's been delivered. And I'm trying to say that nicely. Uh, what's your advice to us activists regarding the election, but also after November, depending on which candidate wins? Well, somebody sent me electronically a, a Biden poster. And I opened it up and I broke out laughing because it says, you ain't got to like the motherfucker. Okay, so, and, 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 and I smiled and I said, they just told the truth. Right? Because the issue is, we somehow think that some politician is going to be our savior. We think it over and over again. If our guy can get there, if our woman can get there, we're going to be saved. That's crap. A politician is only going to protect the political behind. We got to be willing to push whoever is there. Even if we think we like them, we got to push them. Even if we think that they walk on water, we got to push them. We got to push them because the reality is, is that is that nobody's going to do anything for us without us pushing and making sure they get there. And, 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 and right now, you see why it's got to change. And, you know, people can sort of say what they want to say about Biden. And I you know Biden you may give me some heartburn, but I'm going to vote for him. Right? I might vote twice for him. Just joking. Y'all. Don't report to anybody. Right? Uh, but, but, but what I'm getting at is that who you have in office right now could care two cents about you pushing them. 
because he is not trying to be your president or the president of this country. He's the president of a rare, of, of, of a minority of white people in this country, uh, uh, the evangelicals in this country. He, he, they basically ran the Southern strategy in terms of getting elected, which means the hell with the popular vote, we'll get the electoral vote and get into office. That's what he did. Uh, and, and, and so he doesn't care about us. So there's no way you can push this man. There's no way you can rationalize anything with this man. We got to get somebody in there that we can push, that we can show, that we can demand. But the thing is, it's going to demand that we remain activated and active. I remember when, when Obama got elected, I heard Obama say something that just caused my stomach to turn over. He says, we won. It's time for you to go back home because we need to govern now. Biggest mistake of all time. Biggest mistake of all time. You motivate your troops. You activate your troops. You keep your troops in the streets. You keep your troops moving. That's what this guy is doing with the right wing groups that he's got who's storming uh, uh, Michigan State House with firearms and rifles and assault weapons and all this other stuff that's going on in the country. And keep your eyes open because as we go to this election, it's going to be more and more like that. It's going to be more stuff that's going to spring upon us. And so we need to be aware and we need to be ready to fight back. Pastor Hagler, Grayland, uh, you're a good friend for many years. Thank you for coming today. Any parting words for us? Well, thank you, Michael. And I see so many friends on here. Some of them I haven't seen in a while. It's, but it's just good to see some of those faces. And, and uh, bless you all for just continuing to be engaged in the struggle. Uh, because it's not a short-term thing. Uh, we don't win this battle in a microwave minute. Uh, we have to be out there consistently over and over again. The people get sick and tired of seeing us, and we get sick and tired of being sick and tired. I had a thing on Martin Luther King Day. I was uh, down um, speaking on a radio program at a place down in, uh, in, in southeast Washington, D.C., and I walked out, and I saw the mayor sitting over in a booth with her staff around her. And so I walked over there just to greet her, to, you know, to be cordial. And the first thing out of her mouth, she says, what did I do wrong? And I said, I just came to say hello. You didn't do anything wrong today <laughs> yet. Right? Uh, but, but you want folks to look in your face and start wondering what they did wrong. Because they know that you are not going to shut up or sit down. That you're going to be on their case, that you're going to drive home the message, that you're going to make yourself understood. And that... You're not the enemy of anybody, and I'm not the enemy of anybody. In fact, uh, uh, I'm, I, I can consider myself to be the friend of everybody, but I'm not going to give up ground when it comes to justice, and I'm not going to give up ground when it comes to truth. And I'm not going to give up ground when it comes to human life and people around me suffering and dying. And I thank you because you're the same way in so many faces I see here that I know that you have continued to keep on keeping on. Reverend Jerry Fultz there, keep on keeping on. Amen. And I saw Zainab Azam on a little bit earlier, wonderful poet. Uh, but we're going to do what we have to do uh, and make sure that uh, we turn out and vote in November. It, it's can't do anything less. Can't do anything. If you got to crawl there, crawl, but get there to vote. Thank you. all